Hello, welcome to another science and technology Q&A for kids and others. And I see that we have a bunch of questions saved up here. Um, I see one here from Aaron. Is color discrete or continuous? Okay, it's a question I've never thought about before, but let me see what I can do in answering that question. So, uh, what, first of all, color as we perceive it is based on light being sensed by the cells on the back of our retinas. And what, what, what determines the color of a thing? Well, there's light that comes from that thing. And there are many different wavelengths, many different frequencies of light. So a thing that looks to us red will have, okay, first thing to say is um, when you look at light, light consists of electromagnetic waves. The waves have certain wavelengths or frequencies. It's like wiggling on a, a string, except there's no string and there's no wiggling as such. It's the intensity of electric fields and magnetic fields moving through space. And, it's, and what's there is just the presence of that electromagnetic field or not. But the electromagnetic field is, is varying trillions of times per second. And the number of times per second that it varies determines, the in the end, is going to determine the color that you perceive. But, but there are any possible frequency uh, can occur for an electromagnetic wave. There are electromagnetic waves with frequencies of, uh, you know, once once per second, it wiggles sort of once a second, and there are ones that have frequencies of uh, once every trillion, trillion, trillionth of a second. And different electromagnetic waves have different characteristics. So for example, visible light is around a few trillion times per second of uh, a variation of the, uh, of the electromagnetic waves. If you go to lower frequencies, you get down into infrared and then into radio waves, go to higher frequencies, you get to ultraviolet and then X-rays, then gamma rays. But visible light is a very thin sliver of possible frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. It's the thin sliver that happens to be uh, at the peak of what's produced by something of the temperature of the surface of the sun. The surface of the sun has a temperature of about 6,500 degrees, I think, centigrade. And um, a thing at that temperature glows a certain color. It is a white hot thing. And so most of the light it produces is, it's, it's, it's well, we'll explain the, the white hot in a second, but as you heat something up, it the, the atoms are jiggling around inside the thing that corresponds to heating it up. And as those atoms jiggle around, they can emit electromagnetic radiation and the faster the atoms jiggle, the higher the frequency of the radiation. So when the atoms are jiggling quite slowly, you'll get kind of uh, lower frequency radiation that corresponds to things like infrared and so on. As you heat it up, you get progressively higher frequency radiation, and that goes from, uh, from the red, and then it starts producing other colors, yellow and things like this. And eventually you'll get to blue, which is at the, the fastest end of... Uh, uh, of the, the spectrum, but the place where you get visible light, where is is uh, where, where it corresponds to the temperature of the surface of the sun. Um, it's kind of no coincidence that we kind of evolved to have eyes that are sensitive to the kind of electromagnetic radiation that's in good supply uh, for our planet, based on on the uh, uh, radiation produced by the sun electromagnetic radiation produced by the sun. So in any case, the um, uh, within that narrow band of frequencies, you have uh, at one end red light, at the other end blue light, and in between those you have kind of the colors of the rainbow um, of, 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 of colors of light corresponding to those different frequencies. So here's, here's where it gets a little tricky, is our eyes are not determining, oh, that is light of a particular specific frequency. Our eyes just have three kinds of color receptors that 
are roughly sensitive to red, green, and blue, and that basically say this particular piece of light has this amount of red-ish light in it, this amount of greenish light, this amount of bluish light. And it's a little mathematically complicated because what's happening is if, if you, for example, have a laser, a laser has a, a single frequency of light, typically. You'll have a red laser, a, a, a green laser, whatever. The, the, the light coming from the laser will be a specific frequency of light. When our eyes uh, detect a color, what they're doing is they're saying, what's the overlap between the kind of colors that a, a red-ish cell on our retina detects and the actual color of light that you're being presented with. Um, and the way it works is those three kinds of cone cells they are on the retina, they, they are, one of them, it's kind of centered on the, the red part of the spectrum, but it has a little bit, it's still, so, so what's eventually going to happen is a photon of light falls on that, that, um, um, that cell on your retina. And if the photon is of the right, in the right range of frequencies, it will produce an electric result and you'll get an electrical pulse that goes down your optic nerve to your brain and you perceive having, having seen that color of light. Um, but the, the photons that your red-ish cone cell will accept have a range of frequencies. It's not just kind of this particular laser has um, with this very specific frequency is the only one that it detects. It's a range of frequencies, but it's a range of frequencies that's kind of centered roughly on the red. And similarly with the bluish and greenish uh, um, cone cells. So when we perceive a color, and this is something was discovered uh, in the 1700s, I think, we, we, what we're really sensitive to are these three components of color. Um, we're sensitive to how much reddish light is there in there, how much greenish, how much bluish light. And it can be, for example, one thing that can happen is when you really ask what, what is the true color of that thing, what you would have to do is describe the light that's coming from that thing, what, how much light is there of each particular frequency, the whole spectrum of frequencies, how much, how much light is there right in this, uh, this particular wavelength, you know, whatever it is, you know, 300 and something nanometers or something that corresponds to yellow or something like that. How much intensity of light is there at that frequency? How much intensity of light is there at a neighboring frequency and so on? And you can plot a graph that shows sort of how much, how much intensity of light is there at every possible frequency. But when we perceive colors, what we're doing is taking that whole graph of how much light is there at every possible frequency, and we're just saying, tell me how much roughly there is in the reddish area, how much is there in the greenish area, how much is there in the bluish area. So we're approximating that whole curve of how much intensity of light is there at every frequency by just three numbers, the total sort of reddish intensity, greenish intensity, bluish intensity. That means that, for example, there are many different uh, sort of curves that will all be perceived as quotes the same color by us, even though in truth, the, the actual frequencies of light, the intensity as a function of frequency of light is there are many different ones. We will perceive them all as the same because we're just sampling those three numbers out of that uh, distribute uh, out of that, uh, out of that curve. Um, and so, and that, that's, means that, for example, there's the idea of hyperspectral imaging, where instead of just looking at the kinds of things that our eyes look at, red, green, and blue, you look at, for example, 512 different possible uh, frequency ranges, and you say, how much intensity is there in each of those frequency ranges? And that allows you to do things that we can't do with our just sort of unaided eyes. You'll be able to look at something which to us kind of looks, oh, it's kind of whitish, but to a hyperspectral camera, for example, it will say, oh, there's a whole distribution of frequencies here. I can tell that the material that this is made of is such and such, even though to us, it might just look as a, like a, you know, in, in, in a chemistry lab, for example, there are lots of white powders that you'll see in a chemistry lab. Um, 
but to a hyperspectral camera, hyperspectral imaging system, those quotes white powders might all have very different distributions of, of, uh, of light intensity as a function of frequency. And so you'll be able to tell, oh, that's this chemical, that's that chemical, and so on. So, okay, so that's a, a, a what, what our eyes see in the end is just they extract these three numbers or these three intensity values for red, green, and blue, and that's how we perceive colors. And usually the way that um, one represents colors, uh, uh, one can make this thing called chromaticity diagram, which shows uh, uh, kind of it's a sort of triangle-ish shaped thing where it roughly is showing the amount of red, green, and blue intensity. But since we're saying the total intensity of the light has some value, you can plot it on kind of a triangular plot. Okay, so a little math point. If you have sort of a triangle and you put a point inside the triangle and then you put a line from that point to the corners of the triangle, you move that point around, the, the lengths of the total length of those distances to all the corners of the triangle will be the same. So having the sort of triangular plot, it's a convenient way to plot something where the total is all the same the, the total of three values is always the same. And what you care about is the relative values of those, uh, the relative sizes of those three values. So that's the way that chromaticity plots work because you're saying, I assume we have a certain overall intensity of light. Now what proportion is in the red direction, green direction, blue direction? And there are, it's a pretty complicated uh, sort of whole setup because for example, if you know it's this much in this red direction, green direction, blue direction, there's a certain region that is where human vision can actually uh, detect the uh, the light. And if you go outside of that region, you get to places where you know bees that see an ultraviolet can see it, but we cannot. Um, there's this particular region that corresponds to the visible uh, region of, of visible perceivable colors. So. Uh, and, and there are a variety of different ways to represent colors. For example, when we have a typical computer display, if you look under a magnifying glass, you'll see that the display has a, a little uh, pixels of red, green, and blue. And so the way that, the, that uh, a color is synthesized on your computer display is just by having a certain intensity of the red dots, certain of the green dots and the blue dots. But there are, there are a whole variety of different ways in which one can synthesize colors. So for example, when you uh, print, uh, again, it's a little different because when you're dealing with something on paper, you're dealing with the light that is um, reflected from the paper, rather than when you're dealing with a computer screen, you're dealing with light which is emitted from the screen. Um, but uh, there are different colors that are the primary colors used for printing than the primary colors normally used on a computer screen. But you can, you can have a whole variety of different ways to represent colors. There's always three numbers, but what those three numbers are can be different. So for example, there's a, uh, uh, the, the, the amount of red, green, and blue is one thing that's commonly used by computers. There's a, a thing called uh, uh, CIE. Um, it's uh, kind of a standard that was set in the 1930s for how color is perceived. And then there are three parameters imaginatively named X, Y, and Z, which don't really quite correspond to uh, particular colors that we recognize, but are a slightly better way to tell, sort of to represent perceptual color. Why is it important to have a different representation? The reason is, if you want to figure out kind of the distance between two colors, you want to figure out which two colors are so close that a typical person will not be able to distinguish them. If you have a certain coordinate system for colors, then depending on whether you're in the reds or the greens, that distance of distinguishable colors will be different. But if you have a correct coordinate system for colors, then the distance over which you will get confusion about colors will be the same independent of what color you're dealing with. And that's one of the things that's achieved by the CIE uh, uh, approach to, to, to representing colors. So, in any case, I think the original question here was about whether colors as we perceive them are discrete or continuous. The thing I'm just talking about is relevant to that because 
when we look at colors and we look at nearby colors, we've changed the intensities of the light just a little bit. Um, we can ask the question, when are these colors distinguishable? When are they not? For us humans, uh, there are, there's a certain range of color that places where the colors are just indistinguishable. Then we go slightly further away, the colors will be distinguishable. There's kind of a, a hack for at least half of, half of the humans, which is that um, uh, because the, the cone cells that allow us to detect color are coded for on the X chromosome in our genetics, um, the, uh, so what, what's happening is in, in, um, in this cone cell, there's a protein called rhodopsin, which is the protein that is that when it absorbs a photon produces an electrical pulse. And that protein is some whole complicated collection of amino acids. It's all curled up in a certain way. And it has the effect that it presents, it has this arrangement of atoms so that when the photon falls on it, it will, at a certain frequency, it will produce an, a, a, um, uh, an electron and it will produce kind of a, an electrical pulse. But if you, uh, the, so basically we have typical person uh, who isn't colorblind has three different kinds of cone cells, a reddish, a greenish, a bluish one. Uh, people who uh, happen to be colorblind uh, will typically have two different kinds of, um, um, of cells rather than three. Dogs, for example, and, and I think cats also uh, have, uh, are always um, deuteranotropes, I think it's called, um, which are, uh, are um, uh, creatures that have just two kinds of cone cells. Um, and so they, they perceive, uh, they don't perceive the same kind of range of colors that we do. Now, we're not the winners. There are critters that have a lot more kinds of cone cells than we do. I think the, the known uh, kind of champion is the mantis shrimp, which I think has 15 kinds of, uh, of different kinds of cone cells. Um, there are fishes that also have um, uh, more kinds of cone cells than we do. And so we'll have a sort of richer, more elaborate color experience. But for us, typical human has um, uh, three kinds of cone cells, but it so happens that the protein that uh, is the protein that's used in cone cells is coded for on the X chromosome. And uh, the, the way our species works, uh, females of the species have two X chromosomes. Males have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. But if you have two X chromosomes, they won't, uh, they won't necessarily be, they won't be the same. They won't have the same coding uh, for that. Um, uh, potentially, they could have different uh, versions of the rhodopsin protein coded for on them. And so that means that you can end up with, if you're a, a female of the species, so to speak, you can end up with two slightly different, I think it's primarily the blue uh, um, cone cell where this, where this happens. Um, you end up with two different versions of it. And so that means that uh, whereas most of us, the, um, uh, the XY chromosome, half of the species, um, the uh, uh, always just has one kind of blue cone cell. The, the female half of the species can have two different kinds of blue cone cells, although don't always have that. But if they do, then if your brain has recognized which of the cone cells on your retina are blue type one and which are blue type two, you can potentially sense colors more accurately than those of us who have just one kind of blue cone cell. And I think if you look at a retina back of our eye, you'll see there's kind of a, uh, a um, uh, the, the kind of the regions where you'll get things that come from one of the X chromosomes versus the other, usually are this kind of tabby cat um, like arrangement of kind of stripes and so on um, across the retina. So if your brain has sort of picked up Oh, I'm you know when when you were learning to see, so to speak, if it's picked up, oh, there are slightly different. Uh, you sense blue slightly differently in this part of your retina than that part of your retina. 
um, you can end up with this situation where you have better discrimination of colors than um, uh, than uh, than those of us who are who are stuck with just one kind of cone cell. But in any case, this whole question of of uh, uh, what's the range of discrimination of colors? Um, I think that's, I, I think, let me think about that for a second. Um, if you have light coming to your eye and it's a stream of photons of a certain frequency, those photons, so uh, your red cone cell, for example, will be sensitive to a range of frequencies if you if you kind of just are looking at laser light with a particular frequency, uh, hopefully not with a laser shining in your eye, but or at least not an intense laser, but maybe you're looking at a spot of laser light that's reflected from something, um, the uh, then uh, what will happen is that those photons from that laser light will have a certain probability of uh, causing an electron to be produced from that cone cell. And as you shift the frequency of the light further away from the, the peak of the place of the distribution where the, where the cone cell can, um, uh, can detect the light, the chance of it producing an electron will go down. Boy, this is complicated. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I think I have the experience over and over again uh, in these in these live streams that questions that I think are slam dunk straightforward questions turn out to be the ones that have the most complicated tentacles to them. Um, and this is an example of one where I was thinking, gosh, I should start with a simple question and uh, I'll be able to answer that quickly. Um, this is kind of complicated because what we're now going to get into is you've got a um, yeah, you've got what's happening is you've got a protein that when it absorbs a photon of a certain frequency, it will cause an atom to go to an excited state. And then I think, not exactly sure how, how rhodopsin works, but it is, I think, um, the result of that atom being excited by absorbing a photon will be that when it when it it will emit an electron. I don't exactly know the mechanism by which it emits an electron, but what I can say, yeah, I mean that's complicated. The the um, uh, um, the question of whether it emits an electron. It's a quantum mechanical phenomenon similar to the photoelectric effect, um, and. Uh, this question of whether, let me think about that for a second. Um, as you change the frequency of the photon, you have a certain change, you have a change in the probability of producing an electron. And a question would be, does that change happen discreetly as you change the frequency of the photon? Or does that is that change a continuous change in the probability of producing an electron. In other words, as you as you adjust the, the photon frequency, and that is a good question. And I have to say, I would guess that it is discrete, but it has a large number of different levels because um, I think what's happening is, um, boy, it's complicated. Okay. Um, it's in this protein, you will have certain energy levels. Yeah, this is this is complicated. I, I think the answer is it probably is slightly discrete, but you'd never notice it because there are so many different levels that it will uh, appear to be continuous. But I think there may be another effect that at any given frequency, all you're getting is a quantum mechanical probability of something happening. And so it's not this happens or it doesn't, it's rather it really has just a certain probability of happening. And that will again make it more, uh, make the result more continuous. But boy, that's complicated. Okay, sorry about that. That was that was much more complicated than I expected. Um, uh,
let's see. Um, boy. There are all kinds of questions here about color. Why does purple look like violet? When purple is made from red and blue, which are on opposite ends of the spectrum. That's an interesting question. I think, uh, you know, this question of which colors look like which other colors versus what is the actual sort of distribution of light frequencies for that color. That's an interesting question. It's also the question of what color goes with what other color is a, is a complicated perceptual thing that I don't think there's any simple theory about. Um, I think, uh, you know, companies that uh, produce kind of color palettes that you can use, um, it's a matter of artistry to kind of decide this color goes with this color goes with this color. Um, it isn't something where sort of the color harmony, there was a lot of work done maybe a hundred years ago or a little bit more of people coming up with all kinds of color systems um, that attempted to find ways to uh, sort of pick colors that would go with each other, so to speak. And sort of interesting because in the case of music and audio kinds of things, there's much more of a theory of what kind of musical tone goes with what other musical tone. That's what the Pythagoreans figured out back, uh, you know, more than a couple of thousand years ago, um, was the fact that in the end, um, the, the, uh, what, the notes that tend to go together are ones whose frequencies are in rational ratios, like one to two, that's an octave, or three to two, that's a perfect fifth and so on. And because those notes are made by strings of lengths that correspond to their frequencies, um, it was, one could kind of tell, this is made from a string of twice the length, okay, if it's twice the length, it will be one octave down, if it's three halves the length, it will be a perfect fifth down, and so on, um, and that, uh, assuming that the strings are sort of perfect strings, and so on, that's, that's how it works, and one has the idea that that rational number ratios, like three halves, and so on, between frequencies, will give you uh, sort of uh, um, pleasing uh, notes that go together in the audio domain. I don't think there is any such theory for colors. Um, and as I say, there are many different systems, whether you're, you know, Pantone or Mansell or, oh gosh, there are just many, many of these different um, kinds of systems for colors. And in fact, in, in Wolfram Language, we have a bunch of color palettes. We're just about to expand that to a color palette repository, actually, um, where we have sort of artist chosen collections of colors that go together, so to speak, and that have sort of the same, uh, the, 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 the just sort of colors that fit together, colors that in some cases have a uh, good contrast one to the next, um, because um, uh, that's something that's useful in, in visualizations and so on. I will tell you one little, little trick. So there's a, there are different representations of color. So one is RGB, the amount of red, green, blue. Another is uh, hue saturation brightness. That's another common one where there's a hue circle that goes from, you've kind of got the angle in hue space and you go from red back to red again, uh, going through bl blue and so on as the, the thing that corresponds to kind of a hue angle that's 180 degrees away from, from the red. Um, and as you go through sort of the hue uh, spectrum, you're going through the different, uh, well, the different hues of color, whereas saturation and brightness are essentially the amount of white that you're, fit, that you're uh, merging into that. In the case of, of RGB color space, uh, white is just equal amounts of red, green, and blue. Um, so these are just different representations of the same three numbers. But one of the things that's kind of a, a fun trick is if you're looking in in uh, hue, saturation, brightness space, and you want to get a succession of colors that are sort of each one is as different as, as possible from the ones that have come before, a convenient way to do that 
is you've got this hue wheel, you've got this kind of angle in hue space. And uh, a good way to get sort of a succession of different colors is to do the same trick that plants do when they put out sprouts at different angles, trying to make sure that the sprouts that are coming out higher up have as, as little kind of overall shading of, of, of lower down sprouts from the sun and plants, and uh, they have a pretty simple mechanism that does this, but one of the effects of uh, the mechanism is this thing about sort of minimal shading. Uh, the, the mechanism is, I can explain the mechanism too, but the, the end result is that the successive sprouts come out at 137 degrees uh, from the one before them, or roughly 137 degrees, it's actually the golden ratio square root of five plus one over two uh, of um, uh, um, it's it's that ratio. It's one over that ratio. That ratio is one point six one eight. It's one over that fraction of the way around the circle from the previous uh, sprout that came out. And you can do the same same trick with colors, where you have kind of a um, successive hue values are always picked um, sort of a golden ratio away from the uh, the previous hue color. So it's a pretty common piece of code to see hue of uh, fractional part of golden ratio times n, um, where n is an integer counting up, and you're just sort of, uh, you're looking at those, um, uh, those numbers that you get by just adding a golden ratio on, that's that uh, 137, degrees thing on at every step. And that gives you sort of colors that are uh, maximum distance away from all previous colors in the sequence you've had. Um, and that's a that's a convenient thing to do in, in hue space. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to this. Um, uh, I don't really know a theory of what colors go with what other colors. As I say, it usually is an artist chosen thing. Um, Let's see, there's a... Wow, Meme says apparently there are male folk that can have four bizarre receptors as well. That's interesting. Okay, did not know that. I mean, you know, a lot of weird genetic stuff can happen. You know, one can... Uh, rarely people end up being chimeras of two different populations of cells. That's one of the one of the really, really strange things that can happen. Um, and... Uh, uh, that's that happens in early embryogenesis that you get sort of a mixture of two two basically different organisms that end up being two populations of cells and by the way that that embryogenesis works that the the way that that um, uh, you know the way that you actually create um, a growing organism the cells kind of know what to do based on I mean every cell has sort of the full genetic material that tells it what to do but what each particular cell does depends on the presence of, of chemicals that are diffusing through, the, through the, um, the growing collection of cells. And you can end up with two populations of cells that actually have different fundamental genetic material. They were really from two different organisms, um, two different uh, uh, original sort of uh, um, egg cells and so on, um, but which end up being mixed together um, to make this sort of uh, uh, an organism that's really a collection of two different organisms so that you can get the absolutely bizarre thing that you can, you know, you sample your cells and you say, this is my genome. Oh, you sample another one of your cells and it's a different genome. It's a, it's a rare thing, but, it, but that's one of, the, one of the things that can happen. Um, let's see, there was a, there's a question here about from mine shell about astronomy saying, just got an eight-inch Dobsonian telescope. What should they look at first? Um, it's the first telescope. They're excited. Is it possible to discover something unique? Okay, a few things to say about telescopes and so on. One of the things I always find a nuisance with telescopes is that the Earth rotates. And so when you set your telescope up and you point it at some point in the sky, it doesn't take long before, and the higher power your telescope is, the shorter time it will take before it's no longer pointing at that same thing in the sky. And so if you get a fancy telescope, it can have a motor um, which will move it progressively so that 
to compensate for the rotation of the Earth. But otherwise, the thing you're looking at in a few minutes will have gone out of the field of view if you've locked your telescope in place in a particular direction. I have to say that Saturn is always uh, sort of one of the more impressive things to look at. And actually, if you if you go to Wolfram Alpha and you just type in Saturn, it will it should show you the configuration that Saturn is in right now of whether it is uh, which which angle the rings will be at um, relative to to us on Earth. Whether you're looking sort of from the top or whether you're looking from the side at kind of just a projection of the rings. Um, but I always think that's one of the more impressive sort of immediate things that you can see through a through a standard telescope. Um, I think that um, if you like sort of the history of astronomy, uh, the moons of Jupiter are, are a good thing to look at. That was kind of the big discovery of Galileo in 1610. Um, the, uh, uh, I think, what was it? January 7th, 1610, uh, Galileo had this um, telescope that he managed to improve a version of the telescope. The telescope had been invented like a year or two earlier in the Netherlands. And um, uh, Galileo had sort of an improved version, and there are all kinds of funky history of science tales about um, uh, Galileo and his, um, uh, well, one slightly apocryphal tale, is that, I think, um, is that um, uh, Galileo had licensed the telescope to merchants in Venice so that they could run up this tower in Venice and go look through a telescope to see which ship it was that was successfully coming over the horizon which ship was actually going to make it home after it had been doing some trading, uh, you know, uh, trip or whatever else. And then they would, uh, uh, having seen what ship was coming over the horizon, they would run down the tower and sort of place bets in the, in the, in the market, so to speak, uh, for um, uh, about um, uh, kind of like modern stock trading, so to speak, you know, who can get the information fastest and that Galileo had kind of licensed his telescope for all these terrestrial uses. But having done that, it still met, let him free to kind of go up to his roof and um, go and look at look at things in the sky with his telescope. I think that story is not not completely accurate, but it's a but it's a cool story anyway. Um, but in any case, in in um, January seventh, sixteen ten, Galileo uh, used his telescope and looked at Jupiter, and saw these kind of dots of light. Uh, lined up, three dots of light lined up on the on two on one side of Jupiter, one on the other side of Jupiter, um, kind of looking like they were kind of in a in a in line around Jupiter. Well, then he looked on a subsequent day, and they'd moved, and they were in different positions. And over a period of a couple of months, he plotted out the different positions that those different points of light were at relative to the big uh, disk of Jupiter, and um, then observed that yes. Uh, his big observation was that those were the moons of Jupiter. They were things moving around Jupiter as planets move around the sun. And that kind of was a, a validation of Copernicus's idea that, the, uh, that you would have this sort of central body like the sun and things would orbit around it. And by seeing that same sort of thing play out with Jupiter gave sort of evidence that, yes, it, it really was likely to be the case that the Earth went around the sun and not kind of the earlier Ptolemaic theory that um, uh, the sun went around the earth and that we were sort of fixed in place. We, 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 for us, our perception is that we're fixed in place um, and that like the sun moves in the sky, but it is a better physical description to say that the sun is fixed in place and we move around the sun. From the point of view of mathematics, it actually doesn't make much difference which of those we say is going on. It's just we'll have different equations that describe us being fixed and the sun moves around us versus the sun being fixed and we move around it. Um, the equations are somewhat simpler in the end if we assume the sun is fixed and we're moving around it. Um, but in some sense, you can make the mathematics work out either way. Um, it's just when you try to ex sort of generalize it to saying, well, what's going to happen with Jupiter and things like that, then it makes much more of a difference to say, oh yes, the right description is there's a there's a very massive object at the center and other things are rotating around it. So that's another good thing to look at. I think depends on uh, the, somehow many other planets tend to be, to my mind, through 
a typical kind of uh, personal telescope, so to speak, tend to be a bit anticlimactic. I mean, they're slightly bluish, they're slightly, uh, you know, this color or that color, but they're still just little disks and you can't really see much else in them. Um, I have to say that, that um, uh, you know, there are other things you can see, various nebulas and things, which um, uh, those are always interesting. In terms of what you can see that you'll see for the first time, so to speak, uh, comets are a very common thing for people to just, oh, I just saw it, and nobody had seen it before. Um, that's, um, that's one thing. Also, minor planets, asteroids, and so on, that's another thing. You know, the surprising thing is that the sky is quite big in terms of the sort of the total area. And you would have thought that by now with all of the sort of uh, uh, fancy computerized telescopes and so on, that an amateur astronomer would never be able to discover something that sort of the professionals didn't have an automated data feed uh, kind of giving you the information about it. But that still hasn't happened. For whatever reason, it's still the case that people can say, oh, I've I've noticed a comet, I've noticed something that changed in the sky, and uh, the, the official astronomers haven't noticed that yet. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, other things that can change are things like supernovas, exploding stars, um, and so on. But comets seem to be the more common thing that are discovered by, by amateur astronomers. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I, I have to to believe that that's a limited window before kind of there are automated systems that can just do better than uh, than, uh, than than any um, kind of because you know what the the good news about having a telescope is that you are you know you're pointing in a particular direction you're seeing quite a quite magnified view of that particular um, that particular part of the sky. But still, uh, and, and, and usually, you know, a high power telescope is looking at a tiny, tiny region on the sky, um, as opposed to saying, let's survey the whole sky. Um, and, and so, you know, if you took a high powered professional telescope, so to speak, um, it would take it, you know, the number of different directions that it could look in is very large. And it's only something much lower powered where you can say, oh, look at that whole big chunk of sky all at the same time. So in any case, it remains an opportunity for amateur astronomers to discover things like comets and to discover minor planets. Uh, you know, there are, there are a good supply of science fiction stories of the amateur who discovers the minor planet that is an asteroid that's headed right for the Earth. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's small enough that it was never noticed before, but it's big enough that it will cause a lot of trouble if it actually runs into the Earth. Um, I did see a couple of months ago now um, an experiment that was done of having an impactor hit a, an asteroid um, to see whether one could get a spacecraft hitting an asteroid to deflect the asteroid enough that it would its trajectory would, for example, miss the Earth. That particular one wasn't actually headed directly for the Earth. But the, the end result was, yeah, it did seem to work to have something, to have a spacecraft just ram into an asteroid, and it kind of pushed it a little bit, changed its trajectory enough that if you were to do that when the thing was still far away from the Earth, you would be able to, uh, you know, it, it doesn't take very big change of angle to be able to get the thing to just completely miss the Earth as opposed to, to crash right into it. Um, but uh, so I think asteroid defense is alive and well and would actually work. Of course, you have to see the asteroid that's coming first. And there are a, a, uh, an increasing number of uh, often, I think now, space-based systems to try and look for that. But that's another, uh, that's another type of thing is observe a, a minor planet that nobody observed before. I suppose there are other things that are kind of um, the uh, uh, the unexpected phenomena. I mean, the most exciting stuff to see is stuff that's truly unexpected, where nobody uh, thought that could happen. I mean, you know, you'd see some meteorite entering the atmosphere and doing something totally bizarre. You know, normally uh, I don't think you see anything terribly exciting through a telescope um, if you happen to, you know, look at um, uh, 
a, a little little meteorite might be um, you know a pretty tiny thing um, gets hot enough when it enters the Earth's atmosphere that it'll produce enough light that you can readily see it. Um, but you know one could certainly imagine if there was a, a, a meteorite with some very strange composition that you might see some totally bizarre thing happening if you just happen to turn your telescope to the sky at the moment when that meteorite was uh, was entering the atmosphere. Um, but let's see other things that you can see. You know, I, I have to say the um, uh, the new version of Wolfram language that's just come out in the last couple of days has a bunch of astronomy capability in it, and in particular has astrographics, which allow you to produce um, nice uh, sort of detailed astronomical images. Uh, and we have data on a large number of stars and so on. And that's that's kind of a coming attraction. It happens that right after this, the top of the next hour, I am doing a live stream about the new features of version 13.2, the new version of Wolfram Language, which includes uh, our new astronomy capabilities. So just uh, that was an ad for that, um, that activity. Um, but uh, 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 that's some, um, let's see, other things that I can think of. I, I think that's a... Um, that's a good collection of uh, of of um, some basic astronomy kinds of things. I think I've I've um, um, uh, yeah. I think that the um, you know it's hard to say what to look for when the most exciting thing to see would be something utterly unexpected, and. Uh, um, but you can't count on that. But it happens from time to time. You know, there'll be a, there'll be some supernova explosion somewhere, and uh, or some other. I mean, most astronomical phenomena that happen quickly, there's a certain list of no ones that happen quickly. Like a supernova, you know, the star explodes. You won't see anything there, and then suddenly there'll be a. It'll be bright, and it'll stay bright for a few days. Uh, possibly longer than that. There are other kind of variable stars where over a period of time from weeks, months, days, sometimes the um, uh, the intensity of the star will change. It'll be it'll uh, kind of look strange that way. There are other reasons that can happen, like you know there's um, uh, dust that goes in front of a star and so on. Most other kinds of things that are sort of visible on a short time scale are mostly things orbiting in our solar system, um, like, like comets, for example, or like minor planets, where the thing can sort of just be in range and then its orbit will take it out of range and so on. Things that are more at the level of stars and such like, pretty much the only thing that obviously happens quickly is supernovas. Um, I mean, if you had something which is uh, uh, sort of way beyond the home telescope level, so to speak, um, of being able to look for exoplanets, some of those have uh, changed the slightly changed the intensity of of light from stars as they go in front of the stars and so on, and that can happen on timescales of order days to weeks to months and so on. Um, all right, let me see. Uh, Okay, Luis is summarizing here a much better summary than I was giving earlier to say colors in their source are continuous in the sense that you can change the intensity of light. Uh, uh, you can sort of pick any intensity of light. The perception is discrete. I'm not sure about that. I, I could argue both ways because when you're saying a certain intensity of light, light of a given frequency is a stream of photons of a certain energy. And they are discrete photons. They're just a huge number of them. I mean, a typical, um, uh, the, there's sort of an absurd number of photons that are, that are reaching your eye at a given time. If you're, I think the king crab is one of the winners in terms of having very sensitive eyes, uh, living in the ocean and so on. And I think it can detect 50 photons landing on its eye at one time is enough to have it have the 
you know, the sensation of seeing something, so to speak. For us, it's probably a lot bigger than that. Um, although uh, the thing that one certainly can wonder is, as one goes down to very, very low light levels for, for even us humans, the number of photons that land on every particular part of our retina will go down to be really small. And so it's a good question that it, where the answer is not quite trivial in very low light conditions when you can more or less make things out, but it's still, it's kind of difficult to make things out because it's so dark. If you were really recording in a sort of very precise way from your retina, you would be seeing individual photons hitting your retina, that the image would not be formed. The, the image, one reason it kind of looks kind of hard to understand is that it's not, it's not being formed altogether, so to speak. It's being formed from individual photons landing on different places on your retina. Um, but our brains smooth that out so that we just say, oh, it's kind of a fuzzy, slightly fuzzy image. Our brains don't want us to know about photons and so on. They don't want it to appear to be something that sort of fills in in some weird sort of speckly way. Um, so the, the, there really is discreteness in the photons that arrive um, on a retina, although in a typical scene with typical light levels where one can see color, because another thing I should say is when the light levels go down enough, uh, cone cells um, uh, require more photons to operate than our rod cells, which just sense black and white. And so that's why when you're in very low light conditions, you can kind of see that there's an object there, but if somebody says, what color is it? You won't be able to tell because the, the number of photons is not enough to produce a, a signal that you can detect from your color receptor cells. Um, let's see. Maybe um, one more thing here. Uh, Anon is asking about what causes some, um, uh, oh yeah, Kotov is commenting, um, about uh, car lights and contrast and so on. I mean, I think one, the thing to understand about how our retina is set up, we have this fovea in the center of our retina, which is where most of our color receptor cells are concentrated. Our peripheral vision off to the sides is much less color sensitive. I mean, it's, it's all confusing because our brains tend to fill in based on one thing we know somewhere They'll kind of interpolate, they'll extrapolate uh, how, how other stuff works, so to speak. So, uh, you know, if you say, well, what color is the thing to that side? You'll, you'll, you'll have some sense of what the color is, but it's not completely clear whether that sense is, you know, it might be because you've seen that before or, or some such other thing. But one of the things that um, is, is true is that the cells on the, the, we have a high concentration of cells right at the central yellow spot on the right straight ahead on our retinas. And um, uh, those cells are, um, they, they're the ones that are, uh, they, they require higher light levels um, and uh, uh, to, to operate and to let us see color. Now there's kind of this, this trick if you're kind of, um, uh, um, let's see, why does this work? There's sort of a trick when you're out at night driving or something and you have car headlights and you're looking at those. If you kind of look slightly to the side um, when the car headlight is, is shining at you, um, that will cause the, uh, the intensity of light from the car headlight to be uh, affecting the, the rod cells that are not on your central spot. And then when the car's gone past and you kind of look straight ahead again, um, you are, uh, let's see, why does that work? The basic point is that that intensity of light, yeah, right, it takes, it takes some time for the cells that have been sort of, uh, um, that have absorbed photons and allowed you to uh, see from, from that light, it takes some time for those cells to recover from the fact that they were sort of blasted with light. And I'm trying to remember why this works this way. I think, I think that the, are the rod cells less sensitive or recover more quickly? I don't remember. 
I only remember I only remember the kind of uh, uh, practical hack, so to speak. Um, the uh, um, um, there was a question here about um, let me do this and then I should wrap up for today. Um, this is this should teach me to never never start with a question that I think is easy, because they never are. When they when they appear easy, they never actually are. The question here from Anon about asking what causes the Northern Lights. I think that one is easy, but we'll see how we do. So, if you go up near the Earth's North Magnetic Pole, which is these days somewhere in Canada, somewhere in Northern Canada, then uh, North Magnetic Pole, South Magnetic Pole is, is somewhere where there are a lot less people. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, the magnetic poles move around because they're produced by, by currents in the, in the liquid core of the Earth. And the liquid core of the Earth is continually sort of changing the way those currents move. So the, the, the magnetic poles of the Earth move over time. But right now it's in it's in northern Canada. It doesn't it doesn't move very quickly. Over a hundred years, it'll move a, a significant amount. But um, over you know year to year, it doesn't move very much. Um, okay, so uh, what happens is there's a stream of particles that come from the sun. In addition to the sun producing light, the sun produces um, a uh, solar wind of particles. And in the end, it also produces cosmic rays of higher energy, but it produces a stream of particles that come to the Earth, including electrons. And what happens is that um, the electrons get captured by the Earth's magnetic field. It's kind of like when you have iron filings, for example, and you put them, uh, you have a bar magnet, and the iron filings will arrange themselves in this kind of pattern around the ends of the bar magnet to follow the magnetic field lines of the produced by the bar magnet. And it's sort of the same thing happens with the electrons that come from the sun towards the earth. And what happens is that those electrons will spiral in around the, the magnetic poles of the earth. And that um, just like those iron filings line themselves up at the two ends of the bar magnet, the earth's magnetic field is kind of like a giant, the field produced by a giant bar magnet. Um, and uh, the electrons, when they that come from the sun, when they encounter that field around, they spiral in around the poles. Okay, so what? So there's there's many more electrons uh, near the poles of the Earth than there are uh, elsewhere, um, because they got captured by this magnetic field. And when the electrons spiral in, they will be kind of uh, kicking. Um, atoms that are in the upper atmosphere of the Earth. So for example, one of, one of those electrons that's been spiraling in, it has reasonably high energy because it's been sort of accelerated by this magnetic field, things like this. It will knock an oxygen atom, for example. And that when it hits that oxygen atom, it makes the oxygen, it excites the oxygen atom. As the oxygen atom decays again, it produces a photon of light. Uh, I think maybe it produces, usually, most commonly, I think oxygen maybe produces red light, I'm not sure. Um, the, uh, in any case, the, the, the electrons that come from the solar wind captured by the magnetic field of the Earth um, then hit molecules of air, basically, um, and the, uh, atoms from, from the, uh, uh, that are part of uh, the, from the air, nitrogen and oxygen, in the upper atmosphere of the Earth, and that process causes those atoms to produce light, and that light is what we see as the Northern Lights. And um, they tend to have, when you first see them, if you're, you're just hanging out in a place where you can see the Northern Lights, or you're on a plane that's going uh, sort of on, a, on the great circle shortest path from like you know, Europe to the US or something like that, it'll tend to go quite northern, quite northernly, because that's the shortest path, it might go over Greenland or something like this. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, you will sometimes see the northern lights, then when you first see them, they'll tend to be just a sort of grayish color, 
if you let your eyes get dark adapted for maybe as much as half an hour um, and uh, get to the point where you're no longer, you, you don't um, keep on kind of um, blasting those, those um, photoreceptors with photons, you just let the photoreceptors really be sensitive, just those small number of photons that reach them, then you can end up with uh, being able to see the colors in the Northern Lights um, and you'll see greens and reds and so on. You tend to see this kind of curtain effect. Um, and I'm not sure that I know what that's due to. Uh, that, hmm. What is that due to? I'm sort of thinking that that's due to some features of the Earth's magnetic field, but I'm not sure, not sure exactly how that works. Um, but you, you'll typically see this thing will look like kind of a, a slightly bunched curtain kind of thing. Um, there are experiments. There was an experiment that's decommissioned a few years ago now, but there was an experiment in Alaska that involved shooting a kind of um, electromagnetic radiation um, and uh, I think particularly radio frequency radiation. When I say radiation, I don't mean the radioactive radiation, I just mean things that are like made of rays, like, like light rays and so on. Um, but it was an experiment called HARP that was um, uh, aimed at, um, uh, you, you kind of shoot high energy um, electromagnetic radiation into the upper atmosphere and you kind of see what effect it has. And you kind of make artificial northern lights and things like this. Um, and that was, uh, uh, it was an experiment that was done for many years, um, although it was, was recently, I believe, decommissioned. Um, in any case, that's... Um, uh, um, right, that's a little bit of the story of uh, Northern Lights. Well, I think we should wrap up here, and um, uh, I'm giving a plug for my thing at the top of the hour, of looking at the new version of Orphan Language. Um, but thanks for these questions. And I think we got, we got a little bit trapped on uh, these questions about vision. Um, so uh, uh, next time we'll tackle some other ones. And, and I, I might say that, that um, I think we often get into pretty interesting discussions when people ask sort of fairly general uh, kind of questions about how things work or things that you might see some version of them in a science textbook or some such other thing or some sort of general technology kind of thing. And um, I might be able to give you some kind of uh, uh, different perspectives on those types of things. And I think those are, are always good things to, uh, to chat about in this, um, in this, uh, um, in this setup. And I'm, I'm guessing I will be off for a week or two um, for, uh, um, uh, um, uh, over the holiday period, but then uh, we'll be back and um, uh, happy, look forward to uh, more questions, more interesting things to talk about. So, okay, I guess that's, that's um, it for today. Thanks very much and bye for now. <laughs>